Thank you for joining our web seminar, The Art of Unfolding, EndoCup Vision. My name is Amanda Brimmer, and I'll be your host tonight. Joining us from the Olympus EndoCup Vision team is Marketing Director Jason Ashraf. Jason, would you take it away? Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, everyone, for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today for the webinar on the art of unfolding with Endoca Vision. We have over uh, nearly 200 uh, registered participants from across the country, as well as participants from Brazil, Canada, and as far as Malaysia. Thank you so much for, for joining the call and taking the time to learn more about Endoca Vision. And also, thank you uh, to the ASGE organization for allowing us to host this event live from Downers Grove here in Illinois. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce, of course, our host for uh, this webinar, Dr. Seth Gross. He's our guest speaker and a renowned gastroenterologist whose commitment to medicine was solidified at a young age. He was attracted to gastroenterology because he could perform procedures and deliver ongoing clinical care. As an associate professor in New York, he performs advanced endoscopic procedures, and he also conducts research focused on quality in endoscopy, new endoscopic technologies, and the use of advanced and interventional endoscopy. He is a physician who exemplifies commitment, having received too many awards and honors and leads too many commitments and taught too many courses to count. In addition to actively pu publishing, he serves as an associate editor for GIE. Lastly, in his spare time, he happens to be a very entertaining speaker. Allow me to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Seth Gross. Good evening, everybody. First off, I'd like to thank uh, Jason and Amanda and the ASG for letting us uh, present to you live uh, outside of uh, Chicago. And we're going to spend the next 40 minutes or so uh, going over the role of mechanical enhancement, specifically endocuff vision, uh, to help us uh, better inspect the colon for screening and surveillance colonoscopy. And this is meant to be an interactive forum uh, for me uh, to answer any of your questions in, related to in, in relation to mechanical enhancement uh, for colonoscopy. So our objectives uh, for this presentation is to refresh ourselves on the quality indicators for colonoscopy, uh, how we can improve adenoma detection rate without technology, where does mechanical enhancement uh, such as endocuff vision fit into our daily clinical practice, and what is the impact of mechanical enhancement in all phases of colonoscopy, uh, the insertion and withdrawal. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the financial uh, considerations of in implementing endocuff vision into your practice. So this is a very important slide, and it's almost 20 years old, uh, some of the studies that are in this table, and it really highlights us that even though colonoscopy is a gold standard test to help us identify polyps and remove them, and to try to uh, minimize the development of uh, colorectal cancer in those patients undergoing colonoscopy, we do recognize uh, that there is a miss rate of uh, upwards of 24%, depending on the study uh, that one looks at. And uh, these are not small polyps. Uh, some of the studies highlight large adenomas, adenomas greater than one centimeter. And this is very important to keep in mind, and they also talk about advanced adenomas, whether it's advanced histology, and that's certainly going to impact how we risk stratify our patients, so it's critically important to try to identify these lesions. There's another groundbreaking study presented in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, and that talks about uh, adenoma uh, detection rates and how it impacts mortality and then ultimately impacts healthcare costs. And that really does make sense. So if an uh, endoscopist can increase their adenoma detection rate by 1%, they decrease their interval colorectal cancer rate by 3%, and the fatal risk of uh, interval cancer by, by 5%. And for any of us that do colonoscopy, when we do a colonoscopy on a patient, uh, we are responsible for that colon until the next exam. And as we all know, that could span anywhere from three, five, or 10 years, depending on if you find uh, precancerous lesions in the form of adenomas. And if we are able to identify lesions early on in their course, 
Uh, that certainly impacts the health care costs since treating someone for colon cancer today averages about $300,000. So there was a quality guideline, a joint initiative by uh, two of our leading societies. It was updated in 2015, and it looked at uh, common indicators for endoscopy, and there were 15 specific colonoscopy so the, the three main quality indicators that I'd like to talk about are adenoma detection rate, uh, colonoscopy recommendations, postpalpectomy, and uh, cecal intubation rate. And together, if we follow all these uh, appropriately, uh, we will offer our patients a uh, high quality exam and uh, follow up. So, so what do we know? What's changed since 2006? So we talk about adenoma detection rate, and adenoma detection rate is for those patients that are initial screening patients, so at the age of 50. And if uh, we look at a group of 1,000 patients, what percentage of them should have an adenoma? And this could be divided by men and women, and we could also take this uh, in aggregate. Uh, so for men, it uh, is up to 30% now, and for women, 20%. And if you take your whole patient population that is getting their index screening colonoscopy, it should be about uh, 25%. And what about withdrawal time? When we talk about withdrawal time, that's the point where after we get to the cecum, we start inspecting the colon until we get to the, to the anus. And, and withdrawal time should be pure inspection. And sometimes that's hard to, to pay attention to when we're doing uh, colonoscopy and having a stopwatch in the room, but it shouldn't be when you're suctioning fluid or washing. It should be pure inspection, and it should be six minutes or more because there's strong data out there to suggest that those endoscopists, physicians that spend more than six minutes are going to have a higher adenoma detection rate than those that spend less time. So there are a couple important questions when we think about colonoscopy. And uh, where do these uh, impact the procedure? So is colonoscopy operator dependent? Does withdrawal time make a difference? I did mention the six-minute withdrawal. And how does equipment and technology make a difference? And we're going to spend a good chunk of time on the last question, but it's really important before we move to how technology and advancement and equipment can help us do the procedure that we cannot forget the fundamentals of doing a quality colonoscopy. Uh, all the way from where the patient does the bowel preparation, which we have moved to a split-dose bowel prep because it allows for better cleaning of the, of the colon. And then it's up to the uh, endoscopist to really have good technique as they're inspecting the colon uh, to, to inspect as much of the mucosal surface as possible. There was a, a study that had come out a couple of years ago out of Canada, and uh, they had some interesting findings. 29% uh, reduction in colorectal cancer mortality, we're doing a better job on the left side of the colon than the right side of the colon, uh, even suggesting that we're not having good protection of uh, colon cancer on the right side of the colon. And this study is somewhat controversial, and there's a lot of variables of why uh, the data came out uh, the way it did. And when we look at the standardized mortality ratio and you break it up by uh, different specialty, you could see that gastroenterology, those physicians that uh, the, the bulk of their work is doing endoscopy and colonoscopy, they have a better standardized mortality ratio uh, than some of the other specialties. Uh, but we all know that not uh, everybody that performs colonoscopy uh, is a gastroenterologist, and some of our other specialties do this as well. Uh, so there's going to be opportunity to try to improve the, the, the quality of the exam on some of the, the, the mechanical enhancement that I'll talk about a little bit later. So what about withdrawal time? Does this really matter, yes or no? So there was a study uh, looking at uh, less than six minutes or more than six minutes, and this was a landmark study back in 2006. And what it showed is that if you look at all adenomas, uh, those uh, physicians that spent less than six minutes, the ADR was 11.8%, and for advanced adenomas, 2.4%. And for those physicians that spent uh, more than six minutes, all adenomas, were 28.3% and the uh, advanced adenoma ADR was 6.4%. And this has really stuck with us. And over the, the last decade or so, there's been a huge push to track a withdrawal time for colonoscopy. And I think most physicians have some sense of what their withdrawal time 
uh, is today, and they even document that in their procedure notes because it has been an identified quality metric. But there are other studies uh, that have shown, and this is a large study of over 20,000 colonoscopies, 42, position, 42 positions, and uh, they looked at a seven-minute withdrawal or greater. Uh, they did get very good compliance as the study was uh, being done, but they didn't see a significant uh, difference in uh, polyp detection. But at the same time, we do need to have some sort of metric to make sure that we're doing the highest quality job uh, possible. And so the metric that, one of the metrics that we found today is this uh, six minute withdrawal. So in this study, the answer was no. So what about technique? Uh, what could we be doing as the endoscopist during colonoscopy to maximize inspecting the colon? So there was a study where physicians were reported and they were looking at technique. And the things that they were focusing on were fold examination, distension, and cleansing. There was no significance uh, with withdrawal time in this group. And there is a two-fold difference in technique between high ADR endoscopists and low ADR endoscopists. And this is very important because this is a core principle that we have to have good technique before we embark on adding new technology. And to me, the analogy that I think of is I think of golf. I am not the best golfer. And you could take someone that has good skill in golf and give them not the latest clubs and they will hit really well on the golf course and you give someone like myself the best set of clubs, and I will not hit that well. And I think it's just the more you practice and the more you focus and the more you do, the better you will get. Uh, the one thing I would say about cleansing, years ago we did not pay attention to cephalocerated lesions or cephalocerated adenomas, and you'd see some uh, yellowish uh, mucus in the colon and you would sort of brush right by that and not wash it, and that's where these types of polyps are found, and I'm gonna show that to you uh, in, a few, in a few slides. So will new technology help you perform a more effective colonoscopy? I think that uh, there is an opportunity for that, but those uh, foundation principles I mentioned are critically important. So why is detecting adenoma so challenging? The colon's only four to six feet in length. And I think the issue is, is that there are a lot of folds. Depending on the patient, some are more dense than others. We do have blind spots on the proximal sides of these folds, as well as the uh, colonic flexures. Now, I want you to take a look at this slide for a few seconds and uh, looking at the images from A to L, and you, you see that uh, there's a polyp in each of those images, and what does that polyp uh, have in common? These lesions are flat. Uh, they have uh, mucus caps. Uh, they sometimes uh, blend uh, with the normal colon wall. And this is a big area of focus for us in the field of gastroenterology today especially colonoscopy, of how we could do a better job uh, trying to uh, recognize uh, these, these lesions. Uh, because these are the lesions that uh, in the past, when they were removed, uh, the pathologist may come back and tell you that it's a hyperplastic polyp. But now we think differently if we get a report back of a one centimeter polyp in the right colon and we're being told that it's hyperplastic. And the, and the type of lesion that we're that we're talking about are these very subtle sessile serrated lesions. That the more you see the different forms they present in when you do colonoscopy, uh, the, the, more, the more likely you will be able to readily recognize them. And I think we have some good optical tools to sort of help us do this. So after you carefully wash the, the wall of the colon, uh, we have uh, high definition white light uh, colonoscopes today. So I think that's a, a nice uh, way to look at an area of the colon where you're suspicious that a polyp might be present. And this is the, the images that I was alluding to. And if you look at them from A to L, you can see that uh, they all look a little bit different, but they all have very similar characteristics. So you can see there's a rim of debris uh, on image number A or a mucus uh, cap. Uh, in uh, image B and D, you're, you're seeing it in narrowband imaging mode, and you could really see how the, the, the vascular pattern sort of just abruptly stops at the borders of that, uh, that polyp. Uh, but look at the really subtle ones uh, for uh, image K and L. So it's really just getting your eyes in tune to identify these lesions because these are the ones that uh, could easily be, be missed. So these are becoming more and more common. 
uh, they're flat, and the majority of them are on the right side of the colon. And they, they are almost chameleons in terms of polyps in the, in the wall of the colon where they just sort of blend in. Uh, the edges are not always obvious. They tend to always be flat or sessile. And sometimes you're looking down a segment of the colon, you see mucus, and you feel you could see right through that. But I would certainly encourage all of you to, to wash. So why is there such an emphasis on uh, the proximal folds of the colon? And this dates back to a little over 10 years ago where there is a device called the uh, third eye retroscope. And this really shed light on something that uh, people were thinking about, which is, you know, are we missing something on the back sides of these folds? And uh, this was a catheter device that went through the working channel of your scope. And when the catheter came out, it immediately went into a retroflex position to look at the back sides of the fold. And what you're seeing on your, on your uh, screen in a moment, uh, you will see uh, on the left side of the screen, the catheter with the camera. And then on the right side of the screen, you're actually seeing the tip of the colonoscope, which is really strange to see. We don't typically see that, but you could see that the back sides of these colon folds could easily hide polyps. So there was a huge push uh, on the side of industry to try to come up with different modalities to better inspect behind folds. And there are two key ways one could do that. One is an optical enhancement, which is really offering a wider field of view uh, and seeing behind the fold that way. So we had scopes that were able to see up to 330 degrees. And then there was the opposite principle, which is mechanical enhancement, whether it's uh, disposable caps uh, with fingers, and we're going to spend a lot of time on uh, endocuff uh, vision and how the data has nicely matured over the last year to show benefits in adenoma detection rate, the other de detachable caps, or an integrated balloon on the uh, tip of the colonoscope, which is not available in the United States. So endocuff itself has, uh, has changed since it came to market a couple of years ago, and what you're seeing uh, is the, uh, there are different colors, and that's just to fit on the different types of uh, scopes. Uh, there's a, a single row of uh, fingers, and you could see the uh, animation, how the fingers, uh, as you're withdrawing the uh, instrument, start to engage the colon folds. Uh, you're seeing an, an image uh, in a moment uh, at the level of the anus, so it really gives a very good anoscopy to identify hemorrhoids, and I think that is really more one of those added benefits uh, but I am going to show you some other images of uh, the endocuff engaging the colon. And then the bottom image on the right there is you see the tips of the fingers that uh, will not impact uh, the endoscopist for doing any of their therapeutic maneuvers. It actually sort of anchors and stabilizes you to some degree uh, to allow you to put your tools out to do therapeutic uh, intervention. And these are some of the subtle benefits of endocuff vision that you will appreciate once you start to use it on a regular base, basis in your, in your practice. So it's important to go over the key indications of, for, for use. And this is a, a distal single-use attachment, uh, and it's meant to uh, help the endoscopist view the uh, colon field. Uh, it's uh, inserted into the gastrointestinal tract, and when it gets advance with the scope, the fingers hug the shaft of the scope and the cap. So it's not, uh, you know, engaging the colon at that point. It's really staying flush. When the cap or the endocuff vision is fitted uh, onto the tip of the scope, you don't need to use any lubricant because there could be concern that it could slip off. Just use some sterile water to get it in position and uh, make sure that the very uh, edges of the endocuff are not in view and that would mean that it's fitting snugly on the tip of the, of the uh, colonoscope. So what are some of the contraindications? Uh, if, if one is looking for, for a deep uh, insertion into the ileum, uh, it may not be the best option, and I wouldn't use it in that situation. If you have a strong patient population of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis, uh, you, you would not want to use endocuff vision in that situation or if there's a known uh, colonic uh, uh, stricture. If you're doing uh, endosurgical work in the form of endoscopic submucosal dissection, there are other tools uh, and clear caps uh, that uh, is available by Olympus uh, that you should use in those uh, procedures. 
So what are some of the principles of mechanical enhancements when we, when we look at endocuff uh, vision? And in a moment, you're going to see uh, two cartoons. One is the insertion, which I talked about uh, a moment ago, and then there's the withdrawal phase showing showing the uh, sh showing the uh, the fingers engage the colonic uh, folds. And when and when you are doing the procedure, uh, you may initially, when you start to use endocuff vision, uh, feel a little resistance in certain areas, more typically probably in the sigmoid colon. Uh, but once you pass that area, and this is safe to use in patients that have diverticular disease, uh, I've uh, done many, many of these cases without any issue. And so you see on the insertion phase that the fingers are up against the uh, uh, endocuff vision cap and do not interfere with insertion. And on withdrawal, you see that the fingers engage uh, the colon wall. And depending on where you are in the colon, you could have a 360-degree engagement, and you'll see the tips of the fingers which you see to the right of your, of your screen, uh, or you may have to engage the colon with some uh, tip deflection uh, to uh, engage the folds of the colon. And what you're seeing there is a, a really nice example on the top image of the tips of the uh, endocuff vision. And uh, just imagine uh, in the past where you would do a colonoscopy and there is a, there's a fold between the tip of your scope and the polyp. And what's nice about endocuff vision is that it gets that fold out of the way so you have a clear view uh, of, your, of your target and uh, it, it stabilizes you. And you'll notice that uh, after you do a few polypectomies. And the nice part about endocuff vision from a principal point of view is that uh, all of you that do colonoscopy uh, are trained in the, in the technique of it and uh, this doesn't change what you do. Uh, so you shouldn't really notice uh, much, much difference. So what are some of the, the key benefits for endocuff vision? Uh, it has been shown to increase the adenoma detection rate, the unique uh, hinge arm design uh, in the uh, endocuff uh, vis vision minimizes the impact of insertion. And one of the things I really like, and I've seen a tremendous benefit early on, is uh, loop reduction. So that's one of the biggest challenges when we do colonoscopy sometimes. If the patient has redundancy in their colon and you have this loop that keeps reforming, and despite all different maneuvers of abdominal pressure from your assistant, position change, the loop tends to still form. And what I've noticed when I take a loop out with endocuff vision, that loop tends to stay out uh, due to the way the fingers engage the colon. And this is very reminiscent to me when I do deep enteroscopy uh, with uh, balloon technology, where those balloons engage the small bowel and keep those loops out. Uh, you will notice it immediately, and what I've noticed in, in uh, my clinical practice is a shorter time to cecum, and there's some studies out there that suggest there's a shorter cecal intubation. Uh, and then the other thing I've noticed is that I have less scope in the the patient's uh, colon. And I think that's important to have a short colonoscope when you're with, withdrawing and inspecting because it gives you the utmost control uh, to uh, inspect the folds carefully. And when you do encounter a polyp, you're in the best position when your scope is in a stable position and your scope tends to be in a more stable position uh, when there are no loops uh, in the uh, colon. So let's just go over some of the clinical evidence, and, and we're fortunate to have some data even from 2017 uh, showing the impact of endocuff vision. There was a study of 410 patients, and they saw an increase in the adenoma detection rate of 16%, uh, total adenomas uh, 83%, and, it's, and in addition, a, a decrease in cecal intubation of one minute. And, and this type of study really highlights that endocuff vision impacts both the insertion phase of colonoscopy and the withdrawal phase of colonoscopy. So it helps you at both ends of the procedure uh, because I think there is some synergy that if you have a uneventful time to seek them uh, with a straight scope by able to get the loops out, that by itself potentially will impact your ability to do proper inspection and with the help of endocuff vision to flatten the folds, 
we're starting to see in, in studies, and I'll show you some other ones, uh, increase in adenoma detection rate uh, across the board. The next table is very important, and, and the reason why this table is important in terms of surveillance and screening intervals for, for patients with average risk is that half of the table talks about serrated lesions. So the sessile serrated lesions are critically important because they live on the right side of the colon, and, and that's where we worry about getting an interval colon cancer. Uh, and so you really want to be able to risk stratify your patients. And this is a very important table that we should all know and follow because sticking with nationally recognized guidelines is critically important to offer high quality care to our patients. So if someone has a colonoscopy with no polyps, it's 10 years. If you have some small hyperplastic polyps, it's 10 years. And when then when you start to get precancerous polyps, tubular adenomas, whether you have a, a couple or, or several, uh, that's going to impact your next surveillance, which would be three years. Uh, if you have a high-risk histology like high-grade dysplasia, that too uh, would be three years. But let's focus on the sessile serrated lesions. If you have a, a sessile serrated polyp of less than 10 millimeters, it's five years. Uh, if you have one greater than 10 millimeters or if you have multiple, or if you have ones with dysplasia, you would bring that patient back in three years. And then there is a serrated polyposis syndrome, which uh, is, is uncommon, but you would certainly uh, bring that patient back a lot sooner in one year's time. There is a study that I was a part of that was uh, recently presented uh, at the uh, ACG uh, World Congress uh, in October. And what we decided to do was to look at the impact of new technology devices uh, at the published literature. And there were 45 studies, and we looked at a combination of those that were still in abstract form, but really focused on those that were published manuscripts. And the uh, new technology devices we broke up into uh, optical enhancement, uh, and I showed you some uh, images of the optical devices earlier, earlier as well as mechanical enhancement. And we looked at a couple of uh, key endpoints. We looked at adenoma detection rate uh, and polyp detection rate. And I think you need to find polyps in order to have adenomas. And the uh, observation from this meta-analysis was that uh, mechanical enhancements had a higher adenoma detection rate. This next table is a busy table, and it's not meant for us to look at each line. But it's really just to show you that there's been a tremendous amount of clinical research in endocuff and endocuff vision. And there were studies uh, looking at the most common endpoint, which is uh, adenoma detection rate uh, in uh, patients. And these studies were done uh, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. And it's just, it just shows that uh, the adenoma detection rate in the majority of these studies was positively impact, impacted when using uh, endocuff. And the patient population was screening or surveillance. And in some of the, the studies, it was uh, also a uh, diagnostic uh, population. The practice settings were real world practice settings, whether it was academic or community or even a, a veterans affairs hospital where in a veteran affairs population, they tend to have a higher adenoma de at more adenomas uh, in that patient population, and there was uh, even benefit with endocuff in that group. But really, to, to better summarize this uh, table, I created a table to, to highlight some of the key benefits of that meta-analysis or the key outcomes. And I broke it down into adenoma detection rate, uh, right colon adenoma detection rate, and sessile serrated lesions. And so the patients in the ADR group were over 4,000. There were, there were nine studies. And if you looked at uh, standard colonoscopy, which is just a high-definition white light exam, that's what most of the patients underwent in these studies. It was 43.3% versus 54.4% when the endocuff mechanical enhancement was used. The right colon, which is a very big area of study and interest for gastroenterologists, there were over 1,000 patients, three studies, and you saw an increase from 24%, which is standard view without endocuff, to an increase of 33.4% with endocuff assisted. And sessile serrated adenomas, a very big area of focus, as we all know, 
over 1,500 patients, two studies went from 5.6% to 11.6%. And that just shows, you know, how, how sinister and, uh, and difficult to identify these types of polyps are, but endocuff uh, seems to be uh, helping us as endoscopists identify all types of adenomas. There's a recent study uh, looking at the impact of endocuff specifically on sessile serrated lesions. Uh, this was a retrospective study of almost 500 patients, and the uh, adenoma detection rate in this group was 59% uh, uh, with endocup versus 50% without. But really, let's pay attention to the most important part of this study, which is sessile serrated lesions. Conventional colonoscopy only identified 3%, and endocuff uh, increased that to, to 15%. So not only is endocuff being shown to improve adenoma detection rate, but it's also helping us identify the sessile serrated lesions uh, in the colon. So what about some financial considerations? I think that uh, doing a high-quality uh, colonoscopy, uh, sticking with the fundamentals and potentially implementing a mechanical enhancement uh, it does impact the uh, finances of what we do in medicine today, and the finances of medicine continues to evolve and change, some for the good and some not for the good. Uh, but if you identify more adenomas, you're going to increase the recall in your patient population. If uh, someone doesn't have a, a, a precancerous polyp, uh, it's a 10-year interval, but then if you find one, it, you know, it could be five years or three years, depending on size and histopathology. There's, of course, impact on pathology revenue services, and there's been changes of reimbursement that I'm sure many of you have seen, that if you do find polyps and remove them, it uh, changes uh, what someone will get in terms of relative value units and uh, fee for service uh, as well. So there's certainly implications of uh, when we find uh, precancerous polyps uh, during colonoscopy. So really, just to put this all to together, uh, adenoma detection rate is a core quality metric for colonoscopy, and I think another metric we're going to start to see is mean adenomas per patient. Colonoscopy remains to be the, the gold standard test, and uh, there's a, a huge push of uh, colon cancer screening, 80% uh, by 2018, which is next year. We are seeing the benefits of colonoscopy with a reduction in morbidity and mortality in those patients uh, getting the exam. And when you think of how endocuff vision could be helpful, if you're able to eliminate blind spots in areas of the colon, uh, have a better withdrawal or what I call a controlled withdrawal, that synergy will certainly uh, lead to an increase in adenomas in your, in your, in your practice. And uh, the whole purpose of uh, uh, the redesign of uh, endocuff to endocuff vision is to allow the physician, the endoscopist, to uh, better manipulate the colonic folds to allow a more careful inspection and really to see more surface area of the entire colon and to identify those subtle polyps that could be uh, hidden behind a proximal fold or a, a blind spot uh, flexure. But then when you do find that polyp, it puts you in a better position uh, and stabilizes you to make the uh, polypectomy and therapeutic intervention uh, easier. So I think this is a great segue to try to identify, to, to rather answer any of your, of your questions around how uh, endocuff can be implemented in your practice and what are uh, concerns or, or comments that one might have when using the technology. Dr. Gross, thank you so much for the insightful presentation and, and apologize for the bit of a lag that we had with the slides and, and the pictures. Uh, at this moment, we'll move over into the Q&A session, the question and answer portion of this afternoon's presentation. Dr. Gross and Jason, we have a number of questions. If we do not get to your question, audience, please feel free to contact your Olympus Endotherapy Territory Manager. If you don't know who that is, contact us via your website, medical.olympusamerica.com. Our first question comes from Paul. He asks, 
do you have any advice in regards to intubating CTI? So that's a, that's a very uh, common question that comes up, especially for those uh, individuals that are just getting uh, started with endocuff vision during colonoscopy. So I'll take it a step back. Uh, intubating the, the, the terminal ileum without endocuff, uh, you know, that's one of the arts that we learn about uh, when we train for colonoscopy. And I think some tips that will help is when you, when you get to the cecum, it's very important to know where the valve is. I know that most of the time it's quite obvious, but sometimes it's not. But definitely know where the lips of the valve is located. And then the, the next thing I would say is that it's important to, to decompress and suck out CO2 or air, depending on what you use in your, your, in your unit, uh, and that will soften the folds of the, of the opening to the valve. And you'll actually start to see the ileocecal valve pucker a little bit. And, you know, that's your opportunity to engage the, the valve. And everybody has different uh, strategies of passing the, the, the valve and keeping it at 9 o'clock and then pulling back and hoping to fall into it. In my experience, with or without endocuff has been that you can decompress the cecum and it oftentimes allows the opening of the ileocecal valve to look right at you almost like what the uh, opening to the appendiceal orifice uh, does when you get to the cecum in many patients. And then I would engage uh, with that uh, valve, not taut, but, but pretty soft from decompression, and then start to try to uh, intubate. And uh, what I've done is, uh, if you, you know that the endocuff vision is 360 degrees, so I would try to engage one side of the fingers on in one of the lips of the valves to sort of anchor. And, uh, and then that's usually enough with a little uh, right-left torque to get the other side of endocuff vision fingers engaged into the, to the valve, and then you're able to get a, a meaningful insertion. And you won't get a deep insertion, uh, but you should get a nice look uh, into the uh, terminal ileum. Thank you, Dr. Gross. Kevin asks, is retroflexion in the ascending colon and rectum safe with the endocuff? That's also a very good question, and I happen to be someone, aside from doing retroflexion uh, in the rectum, which we all do, I routinely do retroflexion in the uh, right colon. And sometimes that might be the easiest way to take off a polyp that we identify. And it is completely safe. So all the maneuvers that you do uh, without endocuff vision, you could do with endocuff vision. And uh, you won't even know that it's there. Thank you. Mark asks, are the ADR rates in the studies you referenced unusually high, for example, greater than 50%? And what is your benchmark standard quality metric for ADR? So that, that's also, a, a, you know, a very good question. And, you know, as you would expect, uh, many of the authors in these types of studies are physicians that are coming in with a very high uh, adenoma detection rate. Uh, so it's not surprising that you're seeing these very high ADR rates above that 25% index for both men and women. That's a, that's a, a guideline uh, uh, recommendation. And I suspect that, uh, you know, there are, that the uh, adenoma detection rates for many physicians uh, that do high quality colonoscopy are probably above 25% for both men and, and women, uh, and, uh, you know, probably above 35% for the, for the majority. And I think really the, the key is, you know, for the individual, everybody has a different uh, baseline adenoma detection rate. and. Uh, the best way to, to see if uh, endocuff vision would be valuable to your practice would have your baseline adenoma detection rate and then uh, start to incorporate endocuff vision, and, and you should see an uptake in your adenoma detection rate. But the other thing that you're going to see from endocuff vision, aside from adenoma detection rate, is the other benefits that it makes colonoscopy easier. So whether it's loop reduction or stabilization, and, and like with most uh, new technology, it's not going to impact every case. But when you look at your cases overall in aggregate, I, I think you will find that you'll be more satisfied with the insertion phase of colonoscopy 
as well as the inspection phase, which ultimately will increase, uh, lead to an uptick in your, your adenoma detection rate. Thank you. Linda asks, do you feel you use less air? So that, that's a, another good question. And the insufflation for colonoscopy, I think most endoscopists have moved away from air and we use uh, CO2. And I would encourage uh, those of you that are tuning in today that if you haven't made that change, you will see that uh, it is a game changer uh, since you will never get called to the recovery area if you use CO2 on a patient unless there's something serious going on, which fortunately colonoscopy is a very safe uh, procedure. It's really hard to quantify how much insufflation one uses during uh, colonoscopy. I think uh, people are alternating now between uh, CO2 insufflation or air, if that's all you have available, to water uh, immersion. Um, I haven't really uh, paid attention to it. I try to really minimize how much I insufflate on the insertion phase of colonoscopy. And on the withdrawal phase in certain segments of the colon, if I feel that I'm not getting good inspection and vis visualization of a particular uh, segment of the colon, I will uh, insufflate. But uh, I, I, it's hard to, it's hard to, to uh, determine how much insufflation one is, is using. Thank you, Dr. Groves. Prakash asks, have you ever had an endocuff vision slip or fall off the scope? So personally, I have not, and I think it's very important that when endocuff vision is incorporated into an endoscopy unit, uh, that uh, there's an in-service with the endoscopy staff. Because the scenario where the endocuff vision would fall off would be if one put an adult endocuff vision uh, on a uh, PCF uh, instrument. Uh, but if you match the, the right endocuff to the right scope, uh, you will not have that uh, problem. Uh, but personally, I have not had the uh, endocuff vision fall off, but in the instances where I've heard it fall off, it was for that scenario. Thank you. Daniel asks, will endocuff vision raise my ADR? The only way one will know is to try. The, the studies do suggest a positive impact of mechanical enhancement for the adenoma detection rate. And I think that if uh, you're an individual that's looking to improve the quality of your, of your colonoscopy exam, and you've uh, focused on the fundamentals that I've mentioned before, which is flictose bowel preparation, uh, making sure that you uh, have adequate distension and do your best to, to tip deflect and flatten those folds, that is certainly made easier uh, with uh, the fingers of the endocuff uh, vision. So again, my suggestion would be is to, to trial it in your practice and look at the pre and post ADR rates for yourself and other members of your group, and then you'll really know, you know how much it's impacting the adenoma detection rate. Keisha asks, what are the contraindications or using the endocuff vision? So the situations where I would stay away from endocuff uh, vision, so I would say that if uh, you're looking to integrate this into your practice, the main indication would be in your screening and surveillance population uh, looking for, for colon polyps. Uh, for patient populations that I would not use endocuff vision is if there's someone you're suspicious for having inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, if there's evidence on imaging of, the, of an acute colitis or severe colitis, and you need to do a uh, and you need to do a, a, a diagnostic colonoscopy, I would not use endo endocuff vision in that situation. Uh, I would not use it if you're looking to get a deep intubation into the terminal ileum. And lastly, if you're a physician that does endosurgery and you're doing submucosal dissection, I would use those clear caps that are happen to also be available by Olympus uh, in those situations. But for the other patient populations out there, endocuff vision is a uh, viable option to use during colonoscopy. Thank you. Donna asks, her ADR is above average. Why would she want to use the endocuff vision? So that, that's a really good question. And uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, reasons uh, 
uh, to consider raising the bar for, for quality. And uh, I don't know what your adenoma detection rate is, and I think it's fabulous that you're above the, the national benchmark uh, recommendations, but it is possible that you have not hit your adenoma detection rate ceiling. And one way to try to, to increase that would be uh, adding a, uh, a technology, in this case a mechanical enhancement, to try to improve one's uh, ADR. But again, uh, you know, I think this is a, a common question that comes up, and the only way to know if a new technology like endocut vision is going to impact your individual practice is to, is to trial it and, and see. And what you may find is that you will enjoy the uh, benefits of endocut vision on insertion uh, with a, a possible benefit of increasing your adenoma detection rate. But, but my suggestion would be is if you're the least bit interested, uh, would be to, to certainly try it. Thank you, Dr. Gross. James asked, how long did it take for you to reach your level of comfort using the endocot? So this is a, a really good question. What is the learning curve uh, for, for endocuff vision? And all the techniques that one does for colonoscopy uh, is the same. Nothing changes. It depends on what type of instrument you use for, for colonoscopy. Uh, and, uh, and this does add a little diameter to it, but, but not much that you should notice. There may be situations uh, in a uh, patient that has a, a tight sigmoid uh, from abdominal surgery or diverticular disease, whether it's known or not known before inserting the scope uh, to perform the colonoscopy, and you may have a little resistance in that area. You know, my experience has been to, to, to deciflate and to, to make the colon less taut in those areas, and usually that will do the job to get around that area or uh, do some water immersion. Uh, but uh, the learning curve, I would say, is, is probably a handful of cases, uh, and you're comfortable. And what you're going to find is, is that, uh, you know, if in the, that initial learning curve uh, uh, patient population of yours, you're going to see some of the nice benefits of endocuff vision on the insertion phase of colonoscopy, and it's really going to put you in a, a, a much better position to have a stable withdrawal uh, when you're coming back from, from, from the CECA. But to, to summarize your question, the learning curve is quite short because it's colonoscopy, and uh, you already do that. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions. And the next question comes from Jeff. How does the staff know when you want to use an endo cut? Is it every procedure? Is it just indicated by you? So that, that's a really good question. And I, I think that, um, you know, when someone's starting off with endo cuff vision, uh, I would focus on the, the patient population. And the majority of our patient population for colonoscopy is screening and surveillance for colorectal cancer. So I think that's a great starting point pop population. Uh, in my unit, uh, the nurses know that I like it even for just diagnostic colonoscopy for some of those insertion benefits uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier. So they'll just uh, automatically put it on for me unless I tell them in advance uh, that I don't want it on for a particular case. But for them, it's more automatic to put it, on, put, it, put it on for me. But I think from a starting point, you know, one of the benefits of endocuff vision from the data is improved adenoma detection rate. So for that population, which I think would be the majority for most uh, gastroenterologists, I, I would start there. And then if this is something that you feel is a valuable tool and you, you sort of know something is valuable where if you work in one location and they have it, endocuff vision, and then say you go to the hospital or another endoscopy unit that doesn't have it, and you notice that, huh, something doesn't feel right or I'm having a little more difficult or I'm not able to flatten that fold, uh, you, you will probably instruct your staff to, to put it on uh, more, more often. Thank you. And our final question tonight, Martin asks, have you found benefits other than increased ADR while using the endocuff vision? So that is a, that's an excellent question, and I'll break it up into to two parts. Uh, so some of the, the benefits uh, that I've noticed on insertion, just I recognize that just using it over time. And I've actually talked to my colleagues, and they've picked up uh, the other subtle benefits of uh, endocuff, which is uh, helping getting uh, loop reduction. 
Uh, other uh, benefits that uh, we've noticed is uh, stabilization on withdrawal, so you won't slip as much. So if you think about cases where you've worked really hard to get to the cecum and uh, you feel very unstable, where any subtle movement you're going to fall back and end up at the hepatic flexor, for example, uh, endocuff will uh, stabilize you and prevent that from happening. I've noticed some benefits with uh, removing polyps, whether it's getting that fold between you and your polyp flattened and out of the way, or just uh, the, the, the bottom uh, part of the endocuff vision sort of raises and stabilizes the scope and keeps you a little more centered. So when you do your inspection, uh, sometimes if you don't maintain the torque, uh, the scope will, depending on the patient, navigate to the right or left of the screen. And uh, the nice part about endocuff vision is those fingers uh, since they go in a 360-degree fashion, uh, keep you more uh, focused in the, in the center. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, things and benefits, rather, that I've noticed uh, using endocuff uh, vision uh, in a large majority of my, my cases. And I think you, too, and others on the call, uh, once you start to use endocuff vision, uh, you will also uh, notice some of the additional benefits. And some of them are just very subtle, and then you really recognize the benefits when you have a case where, say, the, the staff member forgot to put on the endocuff vision. But really good question. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. For those of you whose questions we didn't get to, please feel free to work with your Olympus Endotherapy Territory Manager. If you don't know who that is, visit our website, medical.olympusamerica.com. Dr. Gross and Jason, thank you so much for providing an excellent informative presentation. And attendees, thank you for attending our presentation, The Art of Unfolding Endocuff Vision. Good night.